me in a, a lonely camera, but perhaps you saw it on YouTube, I was speaking from Mark chapter 8. Uh, Jesus asked his disciples, but, but you, who do you say that I am? Mark chapter 8 and verse 29. And he required an answer to that question. I, I, I imagine him you know, staring at his disciples, maybe staring them down until a response came. Who do you say that I am? He wanted them to declare themselves, to come to a decision and to voice that decision. Who do they think Jesus is? What are they going to do about it? Gee, Jesus was very good at putting people on the spot and demanding a response. And so, in Christ's name, I ask, what do you think of Jesus? Will you believe and follow him or not? That's what Jesus is asking each one of us. He wants an answer, and answer we must. Now I'm laying stress on this because Jesus does, and we'll see in our passage here, looking particularly at the last paragraph of John chapter 6 from verse 66, so the very last paragraph of what's quite a long chapter in John's Gospel where he feeds the 5,000 and then he speaks in terms of bread and blood, a way of expressing belief and dependence on Jesus. In this passage here, Jesus is again demanding an answer, demanding a response from those who would follow him. Now I'm stressing these things because it's possible for, for people to go on for years and years in churches or under Christian influence in the home and yet somehow never get around to deciding about Jesus Christ. But we have to do this. And no one can consider themselves a Christian until they've decided what are they going to do about Jesus Christ. And that's why I've chosen this particular passage here at the end of John chapter 6, because it's a, it's a great turning point in the Gospel of John and very similar in certain striking ways to that passage in Mark chapter 8, which is the great turning point in Mark's Gospel. Let me point out some of the similarities. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks his disciples, what are others saying about him? But then the follow-up question, what are you saying? Now really, it is similar but different here in John's Gospel, John chapter 6. Uh, this is what others are doing. What are you going to do? Well, what are other people doing? Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. That's what others are doing. He turns to his 12, what are you going to do? Verse 67, Jesus said to the 12, will you also go away? Notice in Mark 8, John 6, it is a time of decision and Jesus is prompting, even demanding, a decision from the Twelve. It's being forced upon them, so to speak, by Jesus. You see, he won't allow people to drift. He wants them to declare themselves, to make up their mind to decide where they're going to stand. Others are leaving. What are you going to do? Now, as we know, the uh, New Testament was first of all written in Greek. I'm not going to bother teaching you any Greek, but the simple point here is that there's an extra use of the Greek pronoun you, which is not strictly required, but 
it's there. You. It's almost as if he's pointing your finger. You know how ministers should never point their fingers to the congregation? That's why the minister, 99 times out of 100, should say we and us, not you. As if, you know, God's word applies to you but doesn't apply. So that's, that's bad preaching. Don't point your finger and don't say you very much. But on this occasion, I've got to. Of course, it's as if Jesus is pointing his finger to each of us, <laughs> you and me, what are you going to do? Now he's asking, and again this is similar to Mark's Gospel, he's asking the twelve generally, uh, notes how it's expressed here, it says that specifically in verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, uh, will you also go away? And uh, in Greek, like it used to be in English, there is the pronoun you, which is plural. We don't have this anymore in English. We just have the word you, don't we? And we can't really tell us that plural or singular. But in the Greek, you can tell, as in Old English, so the authorised version, I quote, will ye also go away? He asks the twelve, but who speaks? It's Peter again. Peter acts as their spokesman. Same as in Mark's, Mark chapter 8, it's Peter who speaks up. Peter again does this. Uh, verse 6, 68, Simon Peter answered him, speaking for himself but also speaking for the rest of them. Notice how it's expressed. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is what others are saying. What do you say? This is what others are doing. What are you going to do? Peter, in both occasions, gives the right answer. Obviously an answer that is meant then also to be on our lips. You have the words of eternal life. Who else can we go to? You're the Holy One of God. Obviously this is the response that we also are meant to make. And so we're faced with a decision. But it's all too easy and common to put decisions off. I can remember a man called Colin years ago in church, reliably you know, turned up to things, as, as we say. You know, he was there Sunday by Sunday, and I asked him where he stood with Jesus. Now, no one had ever asked him that, and he had been in church for years. Well, of course, there were good reasons that people did that. We don't like to embarrass people. We don't want to put the wrong kind of pressure on people. There's a whole lot of reasons why this man could have been in church for years. And no one had ever politely, carefully, in a friendly way, put him on the spot. <coughs> what does he think about Jesus? Uh, we like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Or we just assume, like, why else would they be coming to church if they weren't followers of Jesus? Well, of course, technically, there's a whole lot of uh, reasons people come to church, particularly morning tea is good and so forth. Um, we give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, the judgment of charity. We should be charitable, shouldn't we? Or, or we just hope for the best. But it can be that people can be in church life or people can be around Christian influences and they're never brought to this point of deciding, now you know all this stuff about Jesus, what do you think? What are you going to do? And yes, that's the very thing that Jesus does here. And if we look at the ministry of Jesus, is all the time putting people on the spot so that they have to declare themselves about him. So it's this issue of commitment to Christ and the danger of never getting around to actually deciding and declaring what they're going to do about Jesus Christ. Remember the old saying, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. 
but we never get around to making that decision. So this is the biblical doctrine of procrastination. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only too possible for us as human beings to, to procrastinate and to put off the most important decision anybody can make. What are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Well, what are we waiting for? Uh, please don't bother waiting until Christian faith and commitment becomes popular. It's not likely to happen. Hell will freeze over first, right? It's never going to be the popular choice, let's face it. It's never going to, you're never going to hear the words, everybody's doing it, if we're talking about coming to faith in Christ, right? So please don't wait until this becomes the popular uh, um, kind of response. Uh, really, whenever a person decides, I'm going to follow Jesus, what we discover is we're swimming against the tide. It's just like in our passage here, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went with him. And it's in that context, context, contest. Everyone's going that way. And Jesus is asking, are you willing to go with me this way? But always the environment in which a person is when they're deciding, are they going to follow Jesus? And in this passage, very sadly, isn't it? It's the context of defection. Many of his disciples would be disciples, uh, you know, people on the fringe, they decide, no, nope, we're not going to follow Jesus. But in that, those are the very circumstances in which Jesus here is calling on his disciples to declare themselves. What are you going to do? So if we're in that process of decision, it's not likely we're going to get much help and inspiration looking around what are other people doing about Jesus? What, 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 what decision are other people making? It could well be the case we're going to have to go it alone. And that's very often the situation when a person decides to follow Jesus. Basically what we need to be able to say, uh, I don't care what other people are doing, I'm going to follow Jesus. Nine times out of ten. That's what we, in effect, are going to have to say. If we come to faith and begin to be his disciples, doesn't matter what other people are doing, I'm going to follow Jesus. Jesus. Faith in Jesus is not likely to be majority opinion or the flavour of the month. It's just not going to be. But we need to make that decision. It's never been easy. Way back. The first letter of Peter. Peter reminds us in it, the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved as through water. It was a minority option at the time of the flood. All right, who's going to trust in God? Eight people put their hand up, don't they? Eight people saved through the flood. Remember the noble words of Joshua, and these words you'll recognise them. Perhaps you saw them framed in your mother's or grandmother's kitchen, Christian people used to have this up in their house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Famous verses. Elijah, the prophet, was moved to say, I quote, I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He thought he was the only one who was still following the Lord. God had to remind me, well, there are 7,000 others who have not yet gone over to Baal, but it was a minority option. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, again I quote, save yourself from this corrupt generation. In other words, if we're making up our mind about Jesus Christ, are we going to believe in him? Are we going to follow him? Are we going to hand over ourselves to him? this most important decision, uh, well, we've got to do it irrespective of what other people are doing. 
Uh, and uh, it's a hard decision made all the harder because other people may not understand, approve or support us in that decision. So I'm really not being very encouraging this morning, am I? But I am trying to be realistic and I am trying to be biblical. And really, I haven't yet stated what the real difficulty is. Right, it sounds as if I have. You know, I mean, that's, this is never going to be the popular um, option, is it? Uh, you know, Jesus, he's never going to win an election. Right? <laughs> you know, it's not the majority uh, decision, is it? But that's not what makes it really hard. In fact, we could say impossible. This decision is impossible without God's help. No one ever made this decision to believe and follow Jesus without God's help. Now we know that, for example, in Matthew 16, which is Matthew's version of Mark chapter 8, Peter makes this wonderful confession, you are the Christ, and remember what Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Peter would not have been able to make that confession of faith without God enabling him to do this. And uh, so it's difficult to come to faith, but not for the reasons that we often think. Like the real difficulty is not the unpopularity of the Christian option. After all, people often show great courage and are willing to follow unpopular causes. So the real problem is not the, that this is a minority option. The real problem is, that, is not that someone has to believe in God. Is that such a difficult thing? Because most people manage to believe in some vague way that there must be some higher power, there must be something behind it all, we must come from somewhere. You know what I mean? Most people, one way or another, believe in some kind of God. So that can't be the problem. The real problem is not that we're asked to accept the miraculous, that Jesus did miracles. And the greatest of the miracles, God raised Jesus from the dead. That's not the real difficulty. Because we certainly no longer have this naive belief that science has all the answers. And even people today with, who may not have any religious belief, they're often very superstitious. You know, no, I don't want to sit in seat number 13. Can I have number 14 instead? You know what it's like? And the difficulty, if you try to sell a house and it's got the number 4 in it, it's a lot harder to sell a house if it's got the number 4 in it in the street number, people can be quite superstitious. So the problem is not that people have real problems with the, with the miraculous. Uh, the real problem, the reason the Bible says it's not just hard, but it's literally impossible without God's help to come to faith in Christ. The problem is the human makeup and what we are like as fallen, sinful human beings. See, why do the people decide here to draw back and no longer follow? It's because of the teaching that they've heard from Jesus. In verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard it, Jesus talking about having to eat his flesh and drink his blood, in other words, have, have faith in him, Many of, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Now, the real problem is that there are things in the Christian faith that don't flatter, rather they offend the unconverted person so that they don't want to believe. What are some of those hard things? What are some of the things that make it hard for someone to follow Jesus. Well, the first hard thing, of course, is uh, who wants to be labelled a sinner? Who wants to believe that they're not as good as they like to think they are? 
See, we cannot flatter ourselves that we're better than other people. Sorry, we're just the same as everybody else. We're all in the same boat. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've got the same sin problem that everybody else has. Who wants to face that? And also that leads on to the second fundamental truth, just as difficult, that because that's our situation, we deserve and are facing the judgment of God. Judgment day is payday and the wages of sin is death. Now who wants to hear that? Who wants to believe that? No one's going to believe that unless God touches our hearts and enables us to see the truth, the truth about us and the truth about our predicament. And the answer that is only found in Jesus Christ, because here's another difficult truth in the Bible that people find hard to accept, that we can do nothing to help ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. People don't want to hear that. Surely things are not quite that hopeless. Surely there's something I can do. No, remember the, the words of the old hymn, not the labour of my hands can fulfil the Lord's the law's demands. We're not saved by works. It's not, that, it's not as simple as, oh, well, I'll try better. Or I'll try to make up for past faults. Sorry, that is just not an option. That just does not work. There's only one way we can be saved. And that's through Jesus and what he has done for us. And people get offended by that as well, don't they? Why? What, Jesus? Well, what about some other religious leader? Only through Jesus. Only because of his death. He's the only person who has paid the penalty for our sins. It's got to be through Jesus Christ. And so we've got to turn to him in faith and we've got to turn from sins. Yes, we've got to give up our favourite sins and start living a life that pleases him. Who wants to hear that? They're the real difficulties. The real difficulties of coming to faith in Christ is because of our human makeup and and the unpalatable unpalatable truths at the heart of the Christian faith. How was it that Simon Peter, despite all that, was able to make this confession of faith? Back in verse 44, in chapter 6, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. God the Father must have been drawing Simon Peter, enabling him to make that faith response. Verse 45, as it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes from me. God has got to teach us. God, through his spirit, has got to convict us of these truths. Yes, I'm a sinner. I've got a sin problem. Yes, I'm facing the judgment of God. I can't do anything about this, but Jesus can. I'm going to come to Jesus. I'm going to trust in him. It's that decision of faith. Not something you or I or anyone can do naturally. It's quite unnatural. It goes against our best instincts. Except our conscience. And when God is at work in our lives, we understand and accept these things. And so here is Jesus putting his disciples on the spot and putting us on the spot. Now, I can remember in my own life when I had to come to this decision of faith because I grew up in the church. My parents were believers. My father was an elder. I went to church, you know, every week of my life up until that point when I was 13 on a Christian camp run by our, from our school, ICF. 
and a man gave a very clear explanation of these same gospel truths from the early chapters of Romans. I'd been in church all my life, but I'd never been put into that decision, a situation of having the gospel so clearly explained, and what are you going to do about it? Praise God. God worked in my heart and life and enabled me to decide, yep, I want to follow Jesus. And I sought out one of the Christian teachers there, a maths teacher of all people, but one of the Christian teachers on that camp, and he said, I want to follow Jesus. So all of us, in and the rest is history, right? Here I am here, <laughs> by the grace of God. But, but that's what all of us need to come to that. So let me encourage you specifically about this. Let's pray. Yes, God our Father, we, we thank you for our Saviour Jesus. He knew how to make people feel awkward. He knew how to make people squirm. He knew how to bring people to that point of decision where they had to declare themselves. Dear Father, we pray. Pray for ourselves. We pray for those among whom we sit. Lord, we pray that each one of us has come or will now come to that point of decision. What will I do about Jesus? Lord, so work in our hearts, minds and consciences that we make the same response as Peter. You're the Holy One of God. To who, who, who else, where else can we go? Who else has the words of eternal life? Who else can take away our sin? Who else can give us eternal life? Only Jesus. Lord, enable us to make that response of faith. If we have done so, help us to hold to it and, and continue in that commitment to our dying breath. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen.